Today we're going to step into the world of Aurora photography and look at how to prepare for a night of chasing the northern or southern lights. It is possible to capture auroras on any camera given a suitable lens. Some camera sensors will give you better results than others, and some lenses will too. We'll get our hands dirty on how to capture an aurora in just a minute, but first, let's talk about what auroras are and how to keep track of aurora alerts. I have spent a lot of time over past decades capturing images in the Arctic and chasing the aurora borealis. As we head towards the next solar maximum in 2025, I've also enjoyed a chance to see them in our southern skies as well. In Australia and New Zealand, we need to be a little bit more patient and wait for those special high level events that push aurora action closer to our southern shores. In the Arctic, however, people live a lot closer to the aurora activity and even a modest solar wind can generate an impressive light show that dances over your head. Auroras are caused by solar winds that lash the magnetosphere of the Earth. These are waves that contain particles and magnetic field that get cast off by the sun during coronal mass ejections. It usually takes days for these waves to arrive from the sun, but the exact speed can vary. And that's why auroras are so hard to predict. The precise angle and speed of solar winds are very difficult to measure until they get closer to the Earth. Once closer to the Earth, we do have a couple of satellites that are specially positioned to monitor for solar winds. When something interesting is coming our way, those satellites give us up to an hour's notice of what is about to happen. There are special websites for tracking the space weather, and that can help you to get alerts to possible aurora storms and accurate information on what those nearby satellites are observing. I posted a link here to the current live aurora predictions, which you can access via my website. say you have an encouraging aurora prediction for the night ahead and you've picked out a spot that is quiet with a clear horizon, minimal town lights and hopefully a forecast for clear skies. My first recommendation for your gear kit is a really sturdy tripod. I know it hurts to spend money on tripods and the good ones are not cheap but you don't want a tripod that has any kind of flex or vibration when the wind blows or when you tap the shutter. You want a good tripod. This is even more critical when capturing a time lapse of the auroras. A sturdy tripod is absolutely essential. The next challenge is your choice of lens. The night sky is very dark, even when auroras are dancing, so a fast lens is essential. I recommend an f2.8 lens or faster. I used to use my old Zeiss 15mm f2.8 with an EF adapter, but an 18mm prime will also get you into the game. How wide you really need to go will depend on a lot of factors. For really big events or any travel in the Arctic, even a 14mm lens won't always capture the entire story. The night sky is very, very big. Sometimes the landscape is very big too. When chasing auroras in the Arctic, 14 millimeters is definitely my preferred focal length. Keep in mind that if you're shooting with a smaller sensor, you'll need to apply that crop factor as well. On the Micro Four Thirds cameras, for example, a 7mm lens gives you a 14mm wide angle. And there are some really good ultra wide lenses out there for Micro Four Thirds. Same goes for things like the Fuji or the smaller Sony models that are APS size, where a 12mm lens is effectively 18. I have a baseline setup where I shoot manual priority, ISO 4000, and f2.8 at 5 seconds. This is my starting point, and on the night, I might need to adjust this as the light changes. 
for a soft aurora on a very dark night, I might need longer exposures, for example. On a moonlit night and a very intense aurora event, maybe two seconds will be long enough. Remember, those big aurora events start gentle at first, but they can get very, very bright when reaching their peak intensity. It's very easy to blow out your exposures if you're not careful. You'll notice that I select ISO 4000, and that's because on the Lumix S5 and S5 Mark II, they feature dual ISO circuits. The high circuit kicks in at ISO 4000. This gives a much cleaner signal than if you shoot with the low circuit at high ISOs. It's a really good feature on many of the Lumix models that makes it ideal for shooting auroras. Not many camera models have a dual ISO feature, but if yours has it, it's really worth getting to know how it works. Some of the Sony cameras have it and it kicks in at around about ISO 12,800. That's important to know because if you decide to drop down to ISO 10,000, then you end up with a ton of extra noise just because you missed that second ISO circuit. I like to take advantage of the time-lapse features on the Lumix cameras and to set up my camera ready to roll while my hands stay snug and warm inside my jacket. Most cameras these days will have some kind of built-in time-lapse mode and it's a great feature. No more dragging around a remote cable or trying to sync a wireless shutter over Bluetooth. I may not always actually assemble a time lapse from those raw files but I can rummage through them and pick out the best stills later. I also set my focus to manual. The focus peaking will help you set the focus on stars and even at f2.8 you will have plenty of depth of field for distant mountains to look nice. That's the charm of a very wide lens. You get a lot of depth of field. And for something extra special, I traveled the Arctic last winter with the Sigma 14mm f1.4 DGDN art, which has zero vignetting and a super bright image. It's an astro delight, this lens, and working at f2, for example, allowed me to capture extra bright frames of the night sky and even shorter exposures. That's really great for time lapse work. But you do have to be extra careful when focusing at f2 or faster, so there's not much room for error. If your wide angle lens is limited to f4 when it's wide open, that's not necessarily the end of the world. It just means you'll need slower exposures and perhaps your baseline setup might end up closer to 10 seconds than five. like to take advantage of the custom settings on the Lumix cameras as well and save my baseline into a custom setting. You can even rename this custom setting to make it easier to find on the night. This makes it very quick to get ready for shooting. Plus you have the confidence that all your preferred tune ups are locked in place. No surprises. Things to consider tuning for your custom setup include disabling the long exposure noise reduction because you don't always want to wait another five seconds before you take the next shot, especially when you're shooting time lapses. I also turn off the IBIS, the inbuilt image stabilization, because it is actually smart enough to try to move the sensor to track the stars between frames. And for time lapse or star trails, that's definitely not what I want. Even the white balance is something I like to manually lock down for my auroras because I prefer a cool night sky to warm. So locking in daylight lets me see a more indicative rendering on the back of the screen. And that reminds me to warn you that when you're previewing your images in the dark at night, no matter how dim or bright you set your screen for shooting at night, it's my experience that we always tend to overestimate the exposure when we look at it on the back of the camera we think it's bright enough, when in fact it can easily be one or two stops underexposed. It's only when we get those raw files back onto our computer that we realize the shot was actually underexposed, and then we end up having to push the raw file in post. And that's a recipe for maximizing noise instead of minimizing it. The more you push a badly exposed file, the more the noise is going to jump out. It is always better to push the ISO range of the camera or just expose for longer instead of underexposing and trying to lift it later in post. Aim for something that looks super bright in the night to avoid disappointment later. When you have a good exposure for auroras, you don't need to give the raw files much in the way of treatment at all. You will want to apply noise reductions on those dark nights and to fine tune the white balance and saturation to suit your tastes. 
moonlit auroras already have a nice blue sky, which brings out a lot more of the vibrance in the green hues. Dark nights, by comparison, have a little less intensity in the colour, so there is a temptation to simply crank that up in Photoshop, but that can end up looking very unnatural and you might lose some of the total range as well. Oversaturating your colours is not always the best way to go. My recommendation is to be gentle. Just. often asked if the human eye can see auroras. And the answer is yes. The problem is that your camera will see it much better than your eyes. The deeply saturated images you see on social media are not quite what the human eye manages to see in the dark of night. The camera simply sees auroras better. They collect a lot more light. For me, the camera has allowed me to enjoy the aurora experience even more. The camera reveals that extra detail and beauty of what's happening in the Earth's magnetosphere. By capturing a time lapse and speeding up those slower sections of movement, we get to better connect with the shape shifting dance of the auroras. I enjoy the time lapse mode for one other reason too. It allows me to step back away from the camera and just gaze up at the sky and take it all in. I get to be 100% present in the moment while also 100% capturing it with my camera. I love the way photography can not only capture moments to remember for a lifetime, but simply bring you closer to those moments and enjoying the world we live in. Thank you for joining me and good luck on your next Aurora Chase, wherever in the world that might happen please hit that like button below. And if you want to delve deeper into my world of photography and advice, come find my website where I have lots of blog articles and photo essays. Have a great day.